threats that seem be beyond our control and yet our choices of how we deal with those events. And the Great Depression is such a perfect um, platform for examining the ways in which people dealt with the fates that uh, were dealt to them. Because they didn't really have too much effect over drought at that time, you know, or the Wall Street uh, stock market collapse. So to me, the 1930s are a really fascinating decade uh, to study. So in full of uh, kind of unexpected stories that we might uh, overlook. So for instance, we talk, and I'm going to talk mostly, about the hard times that people had. But remember those statistics I said, 25% of the workforce was unemployed. Well, that meant 75% were still working, right? Not everybody left, and, when, and not everybody was stone broke. So in fact, when people left, land changed hands. And what we see in the 30s is the accumulation of larger and larger farms. So in um, 1870, Montana's average farm was just 164 acres. By 1930, it was 940 acres. And by 1940, it was over 1,100 acres. So while the, cr the crisis of the 19 uh, teens through the 20s highlighted the economic truths of farming on the high plains. And that was the more land you had, the better chance you had of surviving. So those with more land uh, were able to, um, you know, turn some land fallow one year, plant others, raise some stock, as well as have some mixed farming. And for those who had a little money in the 1930s, you could buy land really cheaply. Um, so lots of people just packed up and left. They maybe hadn't paid taxes for a few years. They just walk away from those debts. And when the county went to uh, sell that land for taxes at auction, people could purchase it for 50 cents an acre or sometimes even 45 cents an acre. And to give you a sense of how cheap that is, 45 cents uh, 19, uh, a sort of 1932.45 cents in 2019 would be $7.74. You should be so lucky to get an acre of land in Montana for $7, right? So we see, um, I've, I've always thought this would be a really great project for somebody to kind of do subsequent mapping of the enlargement of land starting in the Depression to see, you know, how that land consolidation really developed. Other ways in which the Montanans coped with the Depression was um, by sharing work. So for instance, in Butte, miners instigated, with the cooperation of the company, of the Anaconda Mining Company, um, two weeks on and two weeks off to share what work existed among as many people as possible. Uh, people also were extremely dependent upon local charity because I'm still talking here uh, prior to the New Deal. So there's very little uh, state money for relief. People look to churches, to the local Red Cross, to voluntary societies. Um, and of course, Herbert Hoover was president during the first years of the Depression. And um, Hoover had, um, he did not believe in drastic government intervention into the economy. And he was a great proponent of volunteerism. And volunteerism for him had been quite successful. You know, Hoover had been in charge of the Belgian Relief Fund during World War I. He had become head of the US Food Administration, a job he took as a volunteer. And in World War I, there was no uh, formal government rationing. Everything was voluntary. I mean, a lot of peer pressure was put on people but it was all supposed to be voluntary. So he, you know, people couldn't look ahead and see how severe the depression was going to be. And he thought, well, these were tried and true methods and they will get us through this crisis as well. But by 1932, government officials in Montana, all over the country were getting reports uh, from local counties, from investigators that they set, sent out saying, 
you know, this is not something that the local Red Cross can deal with. The churches, not only do churches not have any funds, some churches are closing because people are leaving, right? So something else uh, needs to be done. And, uh, you know, the climate was, in ha was basically in sort of chaos, and capitalism was uh, also in crisis. And, you know, the thing to remember, too, about this period of time is, you know, we live in a period now where the world has embraced capitalism. But in the 1930s, it was a relatively new system, and people saw all kinds of problems with it. You know, we had these great industrial strikes in the late 19th and early 20th century, tremendous inequality of wealth, uh, tremendous um, uh, um, injuries from dangerous mines and mills and factories. Uh, so people were not really sure that this was, in fact, the most effective or beneficial economic system. So we hardly ever talk about capitalism now. But in the 30s, people talked about it very uh, consciously. So when John Haig, the person I started this talk with, wrote to the governor um, from Sanders County, he had already extended over $3,000 in credit to his community uh, to purchase food at the grocery store that he owned, and he could not pay his debts anymore. So he wrote to uh, Governor Erickson, and he said that um, you need to exercise state power. He said state power of the kind wielded during wartime. He argued it certainly ought to be more important to raise money to save life than to destroy it. So again, remember, people are still you know, only a decade out of um, World War I. So it's this kind of situation that led uh, the country and Montana in 1932 to elect Franklin Delano Roosevelt as president, um, hoping that he would take a more aggressive approach to the Great Depression. And within his famous first 100 days, FDR did just that. So he had two goals to spur economic recovery and to administer relief to get people help immediately. Um, <clears throat> and he and his advisors created what we know as the alphabet soup agencies. So all of those agencies I'm sure you are familiar with, the um, NRA, which is not the National Rifle Association at this point, um, the AAA, which is not the American Automobile Association, uh, the TVA, the PWA, the CCC, later came the WPA, uh, the RA, and the FSA. And I'll talk a little bit about some of these. So by far the largest project, a works project, was the WPA, the Works Progress Administration. And um, it peaked in Montana in September of 1936. And at that point, <coughs> nearly 21,000 Montana men and women were working on WPA projects. So let me stop here and ask you, do any of you um, know some things built by the WPA in your respective communities? OK. Uh-huh, yep. So bridges, school gymnasiums, anything else you can think of? The CCC worked in Yellowstone, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Yep, mm-hmm. They, they kind of upgraded Lewis and Clark Caverns. The football field at Montana Tech um, was built by the WPA. There were all kinds of things. The most homely and... <coughs> Um, some people felt absolutely most useful thing was the WPA built sanitary outhouses. Um, in fact, the WPA built, built 2.3 million outhouses across the United States, 8,000 in Montana. And basically what that meant was a concrete slab that you could, you know, put the outhouse on. And um, years ago when I was doing field work up in Sheridan County, somebody took me to the WPA outhouse on their property, which had stamped in it WPA, you know, and the year. So it was everything from, you know, bridges, school gymnasiums, there were some dormitories at 
uh, Montana State, um, roads, uh, sewer culverts, all kinds of what we would consider large infrastructure, but then also these ones that were directly uh, uh, designed to help individual families' health, okay? Um, so in addition to, I think we think of the WPA mostly as a kind of bricks and mortar construction project, but they also, uh, the, the people who created the WPA, also re, uh, recognized that there were a lot of people in the country who did other kinds of work uh, who, who needed employment, who were out of work. And so we also had WPA projects that cataloged library books, that inventoried government records, uh, conducted archaeological excavations. So um, what's the cave over by Billings, the famous? The picture, yeah, picture art cave, that was a WPA project. Um, they had public health nurses administer uh, vaccinations. Um, they um, wrote books. So the Montana WPA Guide to Writers, uh, Writers Project wrote a guide to Montana. Um, the Federal Art Project created almost 3,000 pieces of art. A lot of this work was very geared toward male workers who were seen as the head of the household, but there were lots of single women who were out of work, widows who were out of work, and so the WPA eventually um, uh, creates sewing room projects. You know, they weren't going to put them in uh, masculine jobs. Yep. I have a WPA sewing machine in my living room. Oh my God, my heart is beating. <laughs> The Providence, uh huh. My aunt was in Edmond, Montana, and she did receive the WPA sewing machine, and when she moved to California, she gave it to me. Oh, well, you are very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, you know, the sewing projects they made in Montana, they made over 800,000 garments and household items for. Uh, People who were on relief could get clothing made in the WPA sewing rooms. They also made mattresses. Um, and the government also sponsored gardens, kind of like victory gardens. They produced tons of food, uh, much of which was uh, preserved by workers in WPA canneries. So there were just all of these different niches, apart from bridges and roads and outhouses that the WPA got involved in. <coughs> Montana was very generously rewarded by the federal government during the 1930s. The combination of aid from different federal agencies in Montana uh, was more than 530 million federal dollars. In fact, it ranked only second, second only to Nevada in per capita um, payments. So, um, uh, so we had this long history of federal generosity. But I also want to say that it was not easy for local communities to implement these projects, and they were rife with patronage and with politics. So um, New Deal federal programs, work or relief, clothing, food, was only given to people who were judged to be eligible for relief. And if you, and the people who evaluated that were your local relief committee, which was often the local county commissioner. Uh, who in eastern Montana were often Republicans, who did not support Roosevelt or the New Deal. Um, many <coughs> um, letters in various in papers to uh, Montana senators complained about how the county welf welfare boards um, often led to favoritism, nepotism, cronyism, and outright abuse. One man complained to the governor that the chairman of the relief committee in his county only gave jobs to people who owed him money so that they would get paid and then be able to pay their debt. The first director of the Montana WPA <coughs> was a Republican. So he was a friend of Senator Burton K. Wheeler and many powerful Montana senators or, or, or U.S. senators who were Democrats wanted the New Deal to um, be a nonpartisan program so it would get greater acceptance, right? This was before we had Social Security, before we had what we consider a kind of um, national safety net. So this, these kinds of programs of distributing 
uh, <coughs> public f money for infrastructure or federal relief were really very radical in many people's minds. So uh, Ray Hart was the man who was first appointed in Montana. He was a Republican. And he appointed only other Republicans to the top positions. So this effort to be nonpartisan on Burton K. Wheeler's part didn't really pan out. Um, and Hart argued that there were no Democrats who had the qualifications to <coughs> fill these positions. So the other senator at the time, Montana senator, was James Murray. He insisted that a Democrat replace Hart, and that did take place, but the administration said, but you can't replace any other um, administrative officials who are already in office. So uh, now you had a Democrat in charge, whoops, and then Republicans in office across the state. This sounds kind of familiar to us, right? <laughs> <coughs> so a man from Savage, Montana, which is out by Sydney, uh, remarked that Republicans milked the top Democratic jobs bone dry and then loudly denounced the terrible, wasteful Democratic spending. So politics was rife uh, during the New Deal. And the other thing that was a problem was all administering these new work programs um, were, uh, were complicated. And it required new bureaucracy and hiring of people and paperwork. I mean, gosh, when you do research, there's you know carbon copy after carbon copy. Um, and m local counties, you know, like Prairie County or Garfield County, they didn't have that kind of infrastructure. So there was often a lot of confusion, um, <coughs> poor training. You know, they'd, they would have a hard time finding someone who could type, right? All these forms had to be typed. So this, was, this becomes a kind of hidden story of the New Deal. We think, oh, federal money flowing to the communities, people getting work, et cetera, et cetera. But it was often quite confusing. So one example, in 1935, in the winter, Butte had money for projects. It had men who had been um, <coughs> evaluated as uh, deserving to work on these projects, but they, those men didn't have any winter clothing. So, you know, the agency said it's inhumane to send them out di digging ditches or building roads when they don't have a winter coat. So, you know, trying to get all these pieces together was quite a difficult puzzle. So you had your hand up. That's okay. I just think this is interesting tidbit here talking about the conservatives. I, in the 1960s, I mowed a lawn for this one elderly lady in Mount City, Montana. And she was so conservative. She was so Republican. Even in the 1960s, she would not carry a gun to protest the FBI. Oh. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I have to write down that story. I won't do it till, till we're done. <laughs> yes, that's right, that's right. So, you know, I think that when you, I, I think that this is an important part of the story that to realize how contested these programs often were in Montana. And you know we uh, the the textbooks kind of have the bigger story, and of course one of the biggest stories in Montana was the Fort Peck Dam, which was a huge federal project, and it put um, fifty thousand workers uh, uh, laboring on building that dam between 1933 and 1940. So um, the New Deal really did change the physical and governmental landscape of uh, Montana. But the federal government could not bring rain. And um, the other part of the depression that people talk about, the dirty 30s, had everything to do with dust and insects. Um, dust storms blew away hundreds of tons of topsoil. But the stories that people in oral histories or in their memoirs write most viscerally about, most memorably about, are the invasions of grasshoppers and Mormon crickets. Um, and there are many, many stories of those. But one entomologist who uh, worked uh, for Montana State College at the time, he described armies of crickets that carpeted the ground with as many as 100 crickets per square yard. 
and he recalled posting signs to warn motorists of slippery conditions on highways on, on the Highway 87 south of Billings because crickets had been marching across the road for nearly two weeks. So just amazing roadkill, right? Cars would just slip right over those bodies. So people who persisted, people who hung on through the drought and through the cricket invasions and the hailstorms and the failed banks and everything that was um, thrown at them, even in, in the teens and 20s, some of them still had to give up in the mid-1930s. In August 1936, 90% of the resident landowners in Garfield County sent a petition to Senator Murray asking the government to initiate a land buying program in the county so that they could sell out. So this is also an interesting story from the Depression of farmers turning not to other private property owners to try to sell their farms, but to the government to purchase what was called sub-marginal land, land which they, in their own uh, voices, said should never have been turned to farming. And one of the most radical um, agencies that was set up by the 30s was called the Resettlement Administration, later the Farm Security Administration, which did set up relocation programs, and there were a couple of them in Montana. Um, the Resettlement Administration moved over 10,000 families nationwide from marginal lands to more productive lands. And this was done with the cooperation and often at the request of farmers who wanted to continue farming but could not do so on the lands that they had. So um, one project was the Fairfield Bench Farms in Teton and Shoto counties. The government purchased about 13,000 acres of irrigated land and they drew settlers from a pool of applicants from Prairie, Musselshell, and Petroleum counties and moved them there. So, you know, if you go to Fairfield now, it's this really prosperous um, farming community. It started with this New Deal program. So I'm going to show you um, some slides, because part of the Resettlement Administration, which later became the Farm Security Administration, they, um, they knew that they had to, you know, by the 1930s, most people in the United States no longer lived on farms. But the federal government was trying to, you know, direct all of this relief to farmers. And so uh, some people in the government felt, you know, we need to show uh, the majority of people in the United States the face of rural America and make them realize what people are going through and why they should support programs like the Resettlement Administration and the Farm Security Administration. So they put together this team of photographers and they send them all over the country, a lot to the south, which of course had been very hard hit by the depression. But four people came to Montana between 1936 and 1942. And so I'm just going to take you on a little sort of gallery slideshow through some of their photos. And this is a, a version of the project I worked on that actually folks here at the Historical Society put together by county. So there are um, thousands of photographs that were taken in Montana. Lots of them were not very good. Um, <coughs> and Because uh, it wasn't digital where you could just erase it, right? Everything had a negative. So, um, But we're going to take a little tour here through Garfield, McCone, Richland, and Sheridan counties. So uh, none of the photographers who came uh, to Montana were Westerners. Um, they drove out here. Imagine what the roads were like in the 30s. They write about that. Um, and they all were fascinated by it. I mean, they, uh, uh, they loved meeting people. They loved the landscape. We have some of them um, wrote extensive notes about their photographs. One person, this man, John Vashon, wrote letters to his wife, which are uh, now preserved in the Library of Congress. And so he wrote um, many, many times um, uh, each week. So we have long letters that he wrote describing the country. Um, and again, this was not random picture taking. They worked with a script that their boss sent, like, go and take pictures of uh, sheep farms and of cattle raising and of uh, drought-stricken areas, of small-town movie theaters. And um, so part, but part of it is just 
what road they happen to end up on and who they met. Um, <clears throat> and again, remember, these are not snapshots. They are setting up a tripod everywhere. These are carefully composed images. Um, oftentimes, and you'll see some later, uh, the, there were very few interior shots because there was no flash photography at this time. Um, they posed people because you couldn't catch people in motion uh, with the cameras that were available. Uh, Marion Post Walcott was the only woman who came to Montana. There were just a few women on this project. She did a lot of work um, in eastern Montana and up on the High Line, and she took a lot of wonderful train uh, photographs. This is one of my favorites, because I got to go see this house. So the Harshbarger family, Russell Lee was one of the first to come, and he was in North Dakota. And someone said, oh, if you want to see hard times, you should go across the border to Sheridan County. So he did, and um, someone introduced him to this family. Um, they had 13 children. I met one of their daughters years ago when I was showing these photos, and her mother was pregnant at the time this picture was taken. This was not their original homestead house. This, was their, this had been built as their chicken house. And um, Mrs. Harshbarger said to her husband, it's, more, uh, it's warmer than our house, so we're going to move the family over there. Okay. Um, and this is uh, Bess Harshbarger, one of the daughters. Okay. Uh, so this, this was a man who lived in a dugout um, up in Sher Sheridan County. <coughs> and this was a man who wanted to have a circus in, uh, in Sheridan County. And so he made these circus wagons himself. Uh, people told, you know, Russell Lee about this. He apparently had a large St. Bernard that he displayed as part of his <laughs> animals. But, you know, it was like people had their dreams. I love it. Uh, a couple of uh, bachelor farmers. Okay, we'll move a little bit. Here's a cricket trap. So um, the federal government uh, working with Montana State College and the Agricultural Exper Experiment Station developed uh, bait poison that they spread uh, throughout the fields. There's a photo I don't have here, it wasn't taken by this project, of a fleet of black cars in um, Sydney getting ready to distribute uh, cricket poison. And, uh, and then WPA workers would uh, shovel the cricket. So crickets, uh, Mormon crickets uh, travel over the ground, grasshoppers fly, so you could trap the Mormon crickets on the ground and then they would burn them. They would spread oil and then burn them. So here's um, distributing bait poison. He probably should have a mask. Who knows what was in it? But um, And then there were lots of farmers' meetings, right? You know, these, these petitions I mentioned, farmers had to get together in counties, and, you know, they had to agree that this isn't working. We want to ask the federal government for help. Um, people, a lot of people from the Extension Service would go around, uh, to state to, to different counties to talk to farmers. Yep, all the best amenities, all the modern amenities in Montana. Um, Marion Post Walcott was the only person who photographed Native Americans in Montana. The, her boss back in Washington was not really very interested in uh, Native Americans. He said that that you know other projects were dealing with them. So, but she does uh, go to the Crow Fair um, and takes some photos. And there were still dude ranches. Again, for those people who were still working and went on vacations in the 30s, dude ranches were actually um, an industry that was pretty successful in Montana during the decade. I love this one. I'll do that, yes. <laughs> um, Arthur Rothstein, he was, he was this kind of unassuming, he was only about five feet two, prematurely bald, but he, um, he, had, he must have had a great personality because he took a lot of pictures of men hanging around outside bars. So I can only think that he struck up conversations with them. <laughs> 
Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, really? Huh. I'll have to look and see if anybody, if they made an agreement. Yeah. Okay. Great. Hmm. Okay. This is also a photo that lots of people have tried to identify and nobody has ever come forward with who that person might be. Um, I love this because they all have their hat tans, you know, from there. <laughs> and sheep shearing. So they were very interested in documenting the different kinds of work that people did in rural areas. So we have a lot, in Montana we have a lot on the cattle industry, less on the sheep uh, industry. Um, more from Marion Post Walcott. And then, of course, there was a sugar beet industry in eastern Montana. We have a, just a handful of photographs um, for those. But for many decades, uh, workers from Mexico would come up and work in the sugar beet fields. I just recently found some extension agent records where they were trying to teach um, the wives of workers, you know, kind of modern methods of cooking, but none of the extension agents spoke Spanish and none of the women spoke English. And they sometimes used, reused, repurposed these uh, boxcars, railroad boxcars as houses. Okay. Marion Post Walcott took lots of landscapes and as I said, lots of trains. And then this is an interesting picture because if you think about that earlier one I showed you of the family where all the kids were in bare feet and you know kind of grubby, this was also equally propagandistic because here are people who borrowed money from the Farm Security Administration and now they look, even though the house itself and the yard uh, still looks a little grim, you know the girl's hair is uh, curled, the young boy has glasses, getting eyeglasses was a real problem at the time, they all have on shoes. Um, so this was, you know, 1941. The New Deal had been in effect for almost a decade. So the photographers want to show it's making a difference, right? It's making a positive difference. And then these are from Fairfield, from that uh, resettlement community. Are you? Oh, great. One t years ago when I showed this in um, Great Falls, someone in the audience said, that's my father. <laughs> <laughs> so again, a model farm unit, much, much different than those kind of falling apart houses in eastern Montana. Yeah, mm-hmm. And then only a few, uh, they were not there, you know, the, it was a different agency that built the Fort Peck Dam. We have lots of pictures from Fort Peck, but they were not a part of this project. So this was, he was just passing through on his way uh, to other places. But like this, the New Deal Cash Grocery. So lots of businesses, you know, took on the name, names from the New Deal. The Project Parlor, Butte had the New Deal um, Bar for many, many years. Uh, this is the New Deal Cash Grocery in Judith Gap. Yeah, I don't know if it's still there. So they got to virtually every corner of the state, not, not exactly every county, but most of them. <coughs> She's um, preparing uh, muskrat pelts. I'm not, well, I think that they were for women's fur. If you couldn't afford fox, you could afford muskrat, you know, for those 40s, 1940s fashions. <coughs> None of my students knew what this was. <laughs> I said, oh, how times have changed. 
This is John Vashon's car as he's heading in to Beaverhead County. Yeah, uh huh. And the famous beaver slides. They took a lot of signs, uh, you know, that were just kind of a part of the visual landscape. They, uh, Russell Lee and John Vashon both spent time in wisdom. They really enjoyed their time there. <laughs> Helena, not too many photos from Helena, actually. Yeah? Okay. And then they did quite a bit in Anaconda, Butte, and Great Falls, especially they worked through 1942. So they were also trying to show that the country had come out of the Depression and was ready to be prepared for World War II. <coughs> this is all where the pit is now, so. Mm-hmm. Yep, uh-huh. And then this is the uh, Butte Union Hall. Mm -hmm. Yep, the big portrait of FDR there. Also in the Union Hall, playing poker. This was the Red Light District. This is actually just one of a couple of photographs of the Red Light District in Butte. That might be, this might be my last one. Yeah, okay. So um, we could have the lights back up if that's possible. Um, I'll just leave this last. I like, uh, this is one of my favorite photos. So I guess I just want to say a couple of uh, words in conclusion. <coughs> you know, I think that we have a very, uh, a legacy of really tangled stories from the Great Depression stories about the reluctance of people to accept what they saw as welfare, uh, combined with gratitude for that help. We have stories about uh, Roosevelt kind of coming in as a great rescuer, and we also have stories about the ineptitude of how many of these programs worked on a local level, um, as well as many stories, which I couldn't get into, of <clears throat> how people who ended up working for these projects used their skills to make them work as, as well as they possibly uh, could. So it was, I think, a turning point for Westerners in general and for Montanans in particular <clears throat> in terms of their attitude toward the federal government. You know, except for during wartime, the federal government had really been, uh, had, had not had much of an influence on people's daily life. When people applied for and proved up their homestead, they got their patent and then that was it, you know. Um, but during the 1930s, the federal government is everywhere, right? When you think of the, the number of people unemployed, the farmers who needed relief during the 1930s, the lack of local resources, it's the federal government, um, their benevolence and their bureaucracy that people had to deal with on a daily basis. and. <coughs> Well, uh-huh. <laughs> that's right, that's right. It gave people, you know, and people moved around a lot. When you think about those people, who, those men and women who worked at the Fort Peck Dam, they were not all Montanans. You know, they came from all over the country to work, and people from Montana left the state to try to find more work. <coughs> and 
So all of a sudden you have, you know, a much wider world that you are experiencing. And while, I, while the federal government was not involved in people's daily lives in a way that a lot of people would recognize, we do have to recognize that in fact, we would not be here today without now a couple of hundred years of federal involvement. So they, you know, it's Thomas Jefferson who sends Lewis and Clark out here and pays for that expedition. It's the military who survey uh, <coughs> roads, who remove Indians, who distribute land, who it's the federal government that subsidizes the railroad. All for the <coughs> um, purpose of allowing individuals to settle uh, these lands that we now call Montana. So the federal government has been deeply involved in Montana, uh, you know, for, uh, as I say, a couple of hundred years. The New Deal just makes that relationship much more obvious, right? It's kind of obvious to everybody who wore a WPA dress or who chose to use two nickels instead of a Roosevelt dime. Um, and I think we still have physical legacies of the New Deal all over the state. You know, go out and look for those bridge plates and those WPA sanitary outhouses. So, um, and we all have, and we have, uh, you know, for all the programs that have come and gone, Social Security emerges in the 1930s. That's part of the New Deal. And we have that today, and people will fight to the death to protect Social Security. So I think that we, um, in the 1930s, people on an individual level had to kind of come to grips with accepting a level of Social Security, and I don't mean just that system, but you know this kind of social safety net, um, in ways that they had not done before. So to take government support and figure that that did not mean a lessening of their own individual competence, right? But that it stepped in when individual competence and local charity could not deal with the larger forces of climate and capitalism that were affecting people on a daily level. So I think that to me, one of the great legacies of the Great Depression is um, in the West in particular, is this both acceptance and defiance of government support, of government planning, um, of government oversight. And to me, that is still an uneasy truce that we deal with every day in Montana. So 